Okay, good evening everyone, um, or good afternoon or good morning, depending on whatever time you choose to watch this uh, webinar. My name is Dan Linda Cohen um, and uh, I'm going to talk to you today about uh, my journey, my journey from diversity to decolonization. That's why I've called this session From Tudor Trumpeters to Trio Silences, um, because this will take us on a a very personal journey that I've been traveling over the last 15 or so years. So I'm going to split this presentation into two parts. The first part is going to focus around diversity and then the second part is going to focus around the uh, journey onto decolonization. Now hopefully my screen is going to move on. There we go. So I'm just going to introduce myself uh, first of all. I'm currently a lead practitioner, uh, history teacher at Parkview School in Tottenham. Uh, I am also a writer and uh, have uh, over the last kind of 12, 13 years have written eight books on multicultural British history. You can see two of my favourites there on the screen. Um, the first one, Walter Tull, I uh, was written for the Collins Big Cat Reading Scheme uh, for kind of top key stage true to uh, key stage three. Um, and the second one of my most recent and my most personal book to date, um, Journeys, the Story of Migration to Britain, ostensibly written for another primary school reading scheme, but there's loads of material there that can be used for key stage three as well. Um, I'm also the co-author and collaborator on uh, OCRA and OCRB migration GCSE specifications and uh, co-author of the textbooks for both courses as well. And for five years I was the examiner uh, who wrote the GCSE papers on the migration depth study and the historical environment papers. And finally, I've been, uh, oh, I'm very honoured to be a fellow of the school's history project. Um, and uh, most recently, the cons a consultant for the Colonial Countryside Project, uh, some of which uh, the material I've written will feature in this session. I wanted to start, though, by just clarifying what we mean when we talk about these two key terms, diversifying and decolonizing the curriculum. And I, I think the best example I found was on this fantastic presentation for Charter College of Teaching, um, given by Paul Miller, who you can see, uh, Professor of Educational Leadership and Social Justice. And he talks about this uh, key difference between the two elements. And I found um, that I've really kind of understood now much more than I ever have done uh, before, the difference between these two different key elements. Both obviously very, very important, but there are different kind of uh, stages that teachers can go through to reach these different positions. And what I found uh, myself was I was, I've obviously been involved in this um, work for a long, long time, um, as I'll kind of reveal, uh, in a few slides time but I found myself slightly frustrated and excited at the same time by the kind of moves these this year to uh, encourage diversifying the curriculum which came out of the whole Black Lives Matters movement and um, the, the kind of statue of Colston coming down in Bristol and I found myself excited by the fact that so many people were kind of enthused about diversifying their curriculum and keen to kind of make their curriculum, their history curriculum more representative. Um, and obviously that's a hugely important and positive development. But I also found myself a little bit frustrated in the sense that, you know, there have been people um, myself included, but I'm, I stand very much on the shoulders of giants, people like Haki Maddy and Marika Sherwood and Martin Spafford, people who've been doing this for a very, very long time, 20 plus years or so. Um, and it was less frustration that people were kind of coming to this 
fresh and thinking that this was they, they were reinventing the wheel rather than kind of looking back at the work that has been already done on this um, and it kind of led me to think well, why 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 should I, why am I being frustrated about something which is so positive and so important and so powerful and I think what I came to the conclusion was is that diversifying the curriculum is important and really uh, a very positive step in itself, but is it actually changing anything? And I think that's where my frustration kind of lay. And that kind of led me down the path to decolonization. So let's just kind of clarify what we mean here. And I think just the, the, the statement on this slide is, is the most concise and most precise uh, definition for me. So looking at diversifying by bringing global perspectives into the curriculum which reflects the diversity of students in your classroom but also builds in the work that academics and professionals have been doing to kind of widen the history that is presented before students in your classrooms. But decolonization is more than that because actually what it's about is reflecting on those kind of power relationships that kind of are behind the reasons why there was a need to diversify in the first place. So this idea of um, the importance of colonialism and empire and the impact that, that has had inside our classrooms, outside our classrooms, within the kind of um, history teaching community, within the history uh, community as a whole and so decolonization looks at the way in which we can challenge these systems this systemic racism the systemic injustice that has existed and the systemic um, power struggle uh, which has been so exclusionary and so by moving towards a decolonized curriculum you're not only bringing in those new stories and widening the experience of the students that you're in, but you're actually acknowledging that you have to make space for other histories. And that's what I'm going to try and do, hopefully, in this presentation. So I'm going to split it into two parts. The first part, which I'm going to focus on, is going to look at the examples that I've used in my classroom, my teaching over the last 15 years, about how I've widened the stories that have gone into um, history lessons at my schools. And then the second part, the second part of the presentation will focus on that culture shift that I underwent myself this year in particular, and looking at the ways in which I've changed my focus now to a much more, um, a much more targeted focus around power, power and relationships. So that's what we've got to look forward to. So I wanted to start uh, as well, just kind of like digging back into my personal uh, journey on this. And um, it started really in 2006, and that's when I uh, created the Black History for Schools website. And, um, as much as I would love to say it's bang up to date and has been really kind of uh, updated to include all of the new materials, uh, sadly, the, the reality of uh, time as a, a full-time teacher and parent and so on has meant it's not really as up to date as it should be. But now maybe that's something I can do over the summer. But I started Black History for Schools and the reason why I started is because in 2006 there was absolutely no uh, materials collated in the central hub on these kind of topics and so I was uh, it, you know, it was a, a real door opener for me it created an incredible opportunities for me um, to be able to share the work that I've been doing and to um, get into writing and I was approached to kind of write the first sets of books that I wrote from the Black History series based on the work I had done on Black History for Schools. So it was an incredible um, opportunity and I was, I was very proud of what we, I had done for that. 
and sort of linked into that around the same kind of time um, I wrote this article in uh, Teaching History magazine, Integrating Black British History in the National Curriculum. And the, the key element I focused on in that article was around the way in which you could try and normalise um, black history into the curriculum and drip it into the kind of grand narrative that um, we are kind of in, are teaching then the narrative of, of this country that we, we live in. And so that again was a really important kind of journey for me. There's a kind of really important starting point, um, looking at and sharing ways in which teachers and history departments could widen the curriculum that they were presenting. And so I called this title, the title of the webinar uh, from Black Tudors, uh, from Black Trumpeters, first of all, because John Blank was the first um, individual that I wrote about um, who kind of widened the representation for my students. And what I chose to do was to put him into a beginning history assessment, which I did with my year sevens. I could have chosen any source material, you know, could have covered anything, but I deliberately and intentionally chose to expose my students to John Blank, you know, two very, very well-known sources now, hopefully, the image of him on the left and the letter that he uh, wrote to uh, the king requesting uh, a kind of increase in his salary. And so John Blank, I've written in kind of other articles and on different websites that John Blank was my kind of gateway drug into um, black British history. And, um, you know, he's the kind of gift that keeps on giving, really, because I'm still using him. I'm still kind of, uh, I've got a poster of him off on my wall in my classroom, uh, even today, kind of 20 years after I first came across him. And so kind of linking into uh, what I'm doing at the moment, I thought it would be kind of interesting to share some of the ways in which uh, we have diversified our curriculum at my current school, which is Parkview School in Tottenham, which in itself is one of the most multicultural schools that I've ever worked in. Um, it is in N15, which is apparently the most diverse postcode in the entire country, which we're very proud of. So um, just kind of picking on some of the things which we're going to talk about today. Um, we're, in year seven, we look at the treatment of Jewish people in England from circa 1066 to 1290. And I'm going to share some of the resources on that. Um, we're also going to look at the way in which we look at Miranda Kaufman's book on Black Tudors, and I'll share some of the materials we've developed on that. Um, I'm going to talk about the Irish Migration Unit that we do in Year 8, and a little bit about kind of Walter Tull that we do in Year 9, and then I'll finish off by looking at the, the work we've done on LGBT rights. So I, I haven't got the, uh, you know, there's lots more which I could share, um, and I will come back and talk about the tape letters work, which we are starting to plan. But I can't, I don't have time to kind of cover all of the things as much as I would would like to. So I've had to kind of be very selective in what we're sharing. Um, so just to start with the Black Tudors uh, material that we've kind of started on, and I just want to kind of um, draw attention if you haven't uh, come across the Colonial Countryside Project already which is an absolutely astonishing piece of work set up by Corin Fowler at the University of Leicester. Um, and you hopefully have seen some of the press connected with it, uh, positive and negative, uh, because it's all about the work of the National Trust and opening up the kind of histories of the National Trust to explore and expose the often hidden histories behind those um, National Trust houses. So I'm very privileged to work with Corinne and uh, Miranda Kaufman and put together some teacher materials for primary school uh, students um, on different National Trust houses. And we focused on Buckland, uh, I always get this wrong, it's either Buckland or Buckfast Abbey, I think it's Buckland Abbey, um, where Francis Drake lived. 
And I also wrote about Penryn Castle, which was uh, the home of the Pennant family, who were pretty much the richest family in Britain, as far as I know, as a consequence of their um, work in the slave trade and the subsequent work they did on the slate um, quarries in North Wales. So I'm going to share with you a couple of the materials that we developed from that. Um, and the first one, which I do tend to always start with as well, is a fantastic kind of mystery um, activity, which I've kind of jumped through a lot of the hoops here, which is the Drake Jewel. And I, I always, always love to start with this because it is an incredible um, piece of kind of material culture, um, which just throws open so many challenges to the received kind of wisdom around black presence um, that you know it's not just associated with enslavement that there is a black presence going back not just only to Tudor times but significantly before that um, and also the the kind of relationship uh, which is kind of summed up in the story of Diego and Francis Drake which Miranda's written so brilliantly about is kind of encapsulated in this Drake jewel. So it is a wonderful starting point for your students um, just to kind of really engage with a very, very um, different piece of Tudor material culture. So, you know, we look at Drake, we look at uh, his experiences um, in the Caribbean, and you know, this is just one way in which we kind of use Miranda's book. So we took she's uh, kind of written these uh, lovely little um, openings to her chapter where she kind of creates a little historical narrative, fictionalised version of uh, these events. And we get the students to kind of guess what is going on. And then we move on to a uh, decision-making activity around the events in Panama, uh, which kind of really hooks the students in. The second kind of Black Tudor that we focus on, or I'm going to share with you here, is about um, the work of Jack Francis. And there's a, a direct connection between what's going on at Buckland Abbey, uh, which is where Francis Drake lived, and the Grenville family, who were the previous owners of Buckland Abbey before they sold it on to Drake. And uh, this is the Mary Rose, which, as we know, kind of sunk in the Solent in. I can't remember things, something or other. Uh, never been strong on dates, um, which is a bit ironic. Anyway, uh, we do uh, activities around Jack Francis. I show a brilliant film of free divers. And then we finish off by kind of getting the students to uh, imagine that they were kind of going to sell the story of Jack Francis or exp explain the story of Jack Francis. Uh, in the Mary Rose Museum. So it encourages them to kind of think about real life application of the, the story that they can use. Um, so those are the kind of early, uh, the colonial countries are project stories which I wanted to share. And I just also wanted to dip into some of the Jewish migration histories that we teach at my school. So, because this is the first unit that we do with our year sevens, we want to frame it around key questions that uh, myself and Martin and Hakim Marika, we kind of really struggle, not struggle, we kind of like worked really hard to think about these key inquiry questions. And so the three that you've got here, why do people come to Britain? What was their experience in Britain? What was their impact on Britain? Or how do they change Britain? they have formed for me the key inquiry questions throughout any time I've done any work on migration histories. And I always come back to these questions. They're really fantastic for digging into the, uh, the, the key salient issues. Um, so when we look at Jewish experience in Britain, um, we wanted to start off by talking about the fact that these were not just um, ultimately negative experiences because we kind of look at how uh, ultimately it will end with the expulsion of the Jews in 1290 but there's lots of really good material at, uh, that students can look at that initially there was a very positive experience for the Jews who were brought over to England by the Normans and 
employed in a, a whole range of different jobs, doctors and goldsmiths and um, art, uh, arrow makers and so on, cheese makers, there's a whole range of different jobs and lived in different communities all around the country as well. It wasn't just in the kind of big cities, but kind of quite spread across the whole of the UK or certainly England. Um, and then we do kind of start to explore how this story changes particularly uh, with the growth of the blood libels, which you can see in this image here. We start to kind of question why the kind of attitudes towards the Jews begins to change. And then we move through into the story of the massacre of the Jews in York in 1190, which you know, surprises me how rare this story is in terms of the way it's taught in schools. Um, I actually remember when I did my PGC in New York, um, visiting Clifford's Tower, kind of reading the tiny little plaque at the bottom of it, um, and which because this was in the early 90s, and I hope it's changed since then. But also at the time, there was um, a annual demonstration by York's National Front members, or BMP, I think it was at the time. Um, who would march around Clifford's Tower kind of in a nice celebration of uh, this massacre. But hopefully times have changed. Anyone who's in York at the moment will be able to share some feedback with me about how things have hopefully improved since, uh, since the early 90s. Um, and so what we try to do is look at, get the students to kind of plot uh, this changing experience for the Jewish community and look at some of these key turning points, which is ultimately going to lead to their expulsion. And what we also wanted to do was to try and get a sense for the students of uh, kind of an empathy chart, get some sense of feeling of how this kind of experience would have been for the Jews, so they have to kind of put across to feel, see whether they would be feeling safe and secure or whether their kind of lives are in more serious danger and gets the students to kind of really kind of process some of these changes that the um, Jewish community is experiencing. Now, why have I included the bit about the hungry caterpillar on here? Oh, that's because what we do is to think about historical change or writing a historical narrative for this piece of work. Um, and uh, so I'm getting confused because today I'll, I've also been teaching my students about the hungry caterpillar, looking at it as a, a way of identifying the uh, extent of change. So. But I can share that one, and that's the story for another day. This time we use it to kind of look at the way in which you can build a narrative, which is obviously why I've kept it in here. Um, and here again, we just kind of present the, the overview of the change in treatment of the Jews to the students before they write their historical narrative. Um, but we don't just stop uh, with the story of the Jews in 1290 because we kind of bring it right up to date in here. Eight. And we'll start with this uh, picture here. And I'm sure you're all wondering who this handsome man in this picture is. And of course, it is my great great grandfather, uh, Joshua Schinbaum Levy from Plomsk in Poland, who kind of migrated over to Britain, uh, I think probably around the 1860s or so. And I can trace my family on that side from. Uh, Russia and from Poland and on my other side from Germany. That's a fairly typical kind of uh, European Jewish experience uh, in my family. So we wanted to kind of bring it up to date for the students and kind of make a connection with uh, the Jewish community today because the school is in very close to Stanford Hill which has one of the most kind of, kind of concentrated levels of Orthodox Jews uh, in uh, in England, so they're very familiar. They see this community around, but they are not really aware of the kind of length of time that they've been in this country. So we try and bridge the two um, units together, just by with a kind of big overview of some of the key changes that have taken over, have taken place over this time. 
and then we go into some kind of source work looking at the different um, experiences of the Jewish community uh, in particular looking at things like the Charles Booth maps which kind of focused on the east end of London um, we spend some time looking at the now mosque on uh, Brick Lane which used to be a synagogue which used to be um, a Huguenot church and so on uh, and we kind of bring it up to the 20th century looking at the Aliens Act which was the first um, kind of my immigration act which was passed and uh, kind of direct specifically uh, with the Jewish community in mind. And then we move on as well. I wanted to share a little bit about the Irish migration histories that uh, we teach as well in the school. And again, I'm only giving you a little glimpse of the, the way in which we teach it. These are kind of seven, eight, uh, ten lesson um, schemes of work so I, I can't share all of it but just wanted to give you a flavour um, and we kind of start with a, a, a kind of historical context in terms of the way in which the British have come into Ireland, the kind of ex the way in which the, the impact of the uh, English and Scottish colonial rule um, in Ireland and then we kind of look at the way in which that's led to uh, migration across from Ireland into England in particular. And we've got a range of different kind of source material that we used for the students to kind of toss up uh, the kind of positive and negative experience of Irish migrants. Uh, extracts from different books, images which you've seen and so on. Um, and again, just trying to kind of pull it all together and consolidate that understanding for the students, kind of thinking about whether there was a, a positive or a negative or a combination of the two um, and so they were able to kind of draw that out in their conclusions and the work that they're doing on that. And I think I'm kind of coming towards the end of this first kind of section of the work that we're doing and we'll just want to share some of the 20th century migration histories uh, that we also teach about at Park View. So I mentioned uh, right at the start that I wrote a book about Walter Tull um, about 10 years ago and I've always kind of wanted to share Tull's story um, in the lesson in the kind of schools that I've worked in and so this has kind of evolved over um, the last decade or so and what I used to do is I would teach uh, almost the entire kind of story of the First World War through Tull's experience and I would look at the um, way in which he, we could kind of tie his story into the, the narrative of the war. For example, that he was uh, injured in the first uh, Battle of the Somme, um, later fought at Passchendaele, and so on. Uh, but we've kind of, now, kind of slimmed it down a little bit in recent years, and what we've tried to do um, is pull in Toll's story to marry with the work that was done about Reg Wilkes and uh, the letters that he wrote uh, which kind of opened up history teachers into the kind of way in which we can use letters as a brilliant insight into the experience of soldiers in the war. So what we look at is Tull's letters. We've got two letters that he wrote um, which you can find in uh, Phil um, I've forgotten what it is. Oh, Bill Vasili's um, amazing book on uh, Walter Toll. And um, the students kind of explore Toll's experiences. Um, and you know, we kind of like give them some of the kind of triggers to help them remember some of the different things he talks about. He talks about kind of the water. Uh, as he's going on this kind of mission water's kind of like coming up to his kind of chest height but at least it's water and it's not uh, shells exploding and so on and so the students are really able to get a really uh, kind of deep insight into the experience of a soldier in the first world war but they're looking at it from the perspective of the first black officer in the british army to be given uh, the position to give commands to white soldiers. So he, you know, he is a hugely sim significant um, part of this narrative. Uh, so it's a very 
effective way of normalizing his experience and kind of bringing the students into uh, that wider narrative very effectively. Um, and then they kind of write a little bit of, you know, do a little bit of work about how useful Tull's letters are to understand the experience of soldiers in the First World War. And then we kind of move into um, the post-war um, period and we start by kind of bringing up this, uh, I guess now rather um, contentious is the wrong word, kind of sad, unfortunate, kind of disturbing situation that we've got in the royal family at the moment with the kind of Harry and Meghan situation as it has evolved. Uh, but this was used to uh, kind of pull students into understanding about mixed race relations in Britain and uh, kind of follow it up with some uh, source material that we use around the relationships that were forming in cities like Cardiff and Bristol and Liverpool and London and so on, South Shields up in North of England. Um, and the reaction which kind of came out at the end of the First World War um, and kind of evolved into some 1919 uh, race riots in a number of those cities. Um, and Martin Spafford has written a brilliant uh, piece of work, brilliant activity around the Cardiff race riots. And we look at this um, kind of doing inquest, we look at evidence from uh, participants um, talking about their experience, why they were motivated to riot, the response from the uh, black community in Cardiff, and so on. Um, and then this is uh, the work that we kind of move on to on the Windrush generation. And you can see, obviously, that we've done a huge amount of work with our students to set the context for the, the kind of arrival of the Caribbean community in the 1940s and 50s. And so we're not, you know, just in the same way that when we teach about the transatlantic slave trade, we're not just setting that as a context without exploring um, you know, African empires and African um, kingdoms before European uh, arrival. Um, but in the same way, we don't just teach that Caribbean people came to Britain just at the time of the Windrush. But this is some of the work that we do on Windrush. This is a Windrush game which I developed uh, a few years ago, which kind of gives the students a sense of their, the journey that some of these uh, people went on. And then we look at, uh, as well, after looking at the kind of experiences of uh, Caribbean community in Britain, we do a um, kind of murder mystery activity. Sadly, it's a true murder um, and the murder of Kelsa Cochrane. Um, but the students get very, very engaged in, in this story. And uh, they get a series of clues which helps them to kind of um, try and work out what happened to Kelsa Cochrane. There's a fantastic video which uh, was made a few years ago now. And what I've done is try to extract some of the key images from the, from the videos. Uh, we show bits of the video to the students so they can kind of get a sense of the story and stop it at different places. And we get interviews from people there which we use as eyewitness accounts and so on and then we build we're really building up to uh, work on kind of again the utility of sources uh, that is our focus for this inquiry and we've got a lot of amazing uh, photographs from the time which again just open up so many questions around uh, the relationship between the communities in Notting Hill. And, you know, there were 2,000 people turned up for Kelso Cochrane's funeral, which is just phenomenal to think about. Um, and then we use it to build our kind of, again, reinforce the writing that we do um, with the students. And this is the model that we've always used at Parkview, which is, again, kind of something which we've developed for a long time just kind of helping students to structure their writing and kind of give them a f uh, kind of shared and common language that we use in every piece of writing that they do 
they have this same kind of structure. So they'll know about qualifiers, they'll know about time connectives, they'll know about arguing connectives, and that's just kind of reinforced all the way through. It doesn't matter the topic, you know, this is Kelsey Cochrane, but they'll have exactly the same if they do the Battle of Hastings. Uh, and it just kind of like builds and builds on their understanding of how to write effectively. Um, and then the one, you know, one of the key outcomes of Kelsey Cochrane's um, murder was the desire by people like Claudia Jones to do something to address the, the tension and the uh, breakdown in race relations in Notting Hill and other parts of the country. And so we look at Claudia Jones, we look at her background, we look at why she came to be in London, and we look at the work that she was doing in the West Indian Gazette and thinking about why that was such an important moment uh, for that community, its first newspaper that was produced for them, and how it was able to kind of share those stories from that community and give them a sense of pride and a sense of ownership and a sense of a community. And then we move on to uh, Carnival itself and think about the way in which we, you know, Carnival was, uh, well, in this case, they're doing a little advertisement uh, poster to kind of look at some of the things we actually did take place in Carnival, the Beauty Queen, the steel bands, and so on. And then, so this, uh, this is the final section which I wanted to talk about in the way in which we diversified the curriculum of Park View. Because a lot of the work we've been doing over the last couple of years has been around the LGBT um, British history uh, unit that we've been working on. Um, much as I'm frustrated by everything about COVID, one of the biggest frustrations I've had is that I, we have worked so hard to be able to build this material and create an incredible inquiry. Um, but we've not yet been able to teach it because we were so interrupted by the lockdown early in the year. We haven't had a chance to deliver this, but we will do it this year, come hell or high water. So you can see the um, inquiry question we've got there, Pop Cultural Parliament, which has done more for LGBT rights. And I just wanted to give you again a flavour of the kind of stories that we include here. Um, we'll start with a kind of overview of some of these key um, kind of changes just to get students to get an understanding of the big picture that we're working towards and then we'll kind of dig into some of these stories in a deeper level and this one this picture I'm indebted to um, Vicky uh, I'm gonna embarrass myself now by forgetting her name but we had a wonderful talk from uh, Vicky from the National Archives, who's the specialist uh, archivist on LGBT history, who came to the school. And uh, she shared this story about the Caravan Club, which is a picture here, uh, in Soho in the 1930s. And there was a police raid on the club, and they found, kind of hidden away, um, and kind of torn a little bit into pieces, a letter, a love letter from two of the members of the caravan club um, which the police kind of painstakingly pieced together to present as evidence in a court trial and the wonderful thing about that for us historians today is we now have this incredible transcript of this uh, kind of love letter between uh, Cyril and his uh, unrequited love um, and so we use that as a really fantastic uh, source to kind of get the students understanding what it was like to be um, a homosexual man in the 1930s when it was illegal and they kind of uh, incredible ways in which that community was able to survive um, kind of discreetly um, but still kind of live their lives in a meaningful way so we kind of start with things like that uh, and then we kind of explore things like the uh, Operation Rupert, which was this uh, absolutely uh, outrageous and astonishingly uh, entertaining story of um, a plan to disrupt the Festival of Light, which was set up by uh, no lesser than Mary Whitehouse. Um, and I think, I'm sure, dear old Cliff Richards was in attendance at that. But this was a big kind of campaign that Mary Whitehouse was leading to. Uh, you know, 
share her vision of a Christian community in Britain and the GLF, the Gay Liberation Front, infiltrated this event and uh, just did the most hilarious, entertaining kind of civil disruption of this campaign. So we get the students to look at that event and kind of imagine themselves uh, doing something similar. Um, and then we look at uh, the way in which people like uh, David Bowie, pop stars like Bowie and um, Lou Reed. Uh, we'll look at people, we'll look at popular culture like uh, the Rocky Horror Picture Show and look at the ways in which people like Bowie helped LGBT people in the 1970s to be quote filled with hope that's a direct quote from uh, a video clip which we show about a young man in Liverpool who saw Bowie uh, for the first time on television putting his arm around Mick Wilson while he was singing Starman on top of the pops and this was like a he, could, he talks about his heart coming out of his chest uh, and that's such a kind of important moment for him so again we're kind of exploring a whole range of different ways in which these diverse stories are you know so powerful and so important and so engaging for our young people and i think we're going to bring that this first section to an end so you can go and have a cup of tea uh, or a nice chocolate biscuit and then come and watch this second part in uh, when you have another bit of time so thank you for that when we come back we're going to talk about uh, the journey to decolonization and look at the big influences that have had an impact on my journey there. Thank you. Thanks for watching this video from the Bebold History Network. If you enjoyed this video, please hit subscribe on our YouTube channel. You can also get in touch with us on Twitter at Bebold History. And if you are talking about us, use the hashtag Bebold History.